Hey everyone, welcome to BCP Med. In this video, we're going to be taking a look at the very basics of how you draw organic resonance structures using arrow pushing to denote the movement of electrons from one structure to the other. This is going to be a very fundamental introductory video, so we're not going to go over too many complicated examples, but look at both the structural picture and the molecular orbital picture of how the electrons move from one resonance structure to the other. Let's go ahead and get started. So to start off, the first thing I want to do is look at how you actually just go about splitting up a pi bond into its constituent formal charges. So when you have a double bonded system, say like the molecule ethylene here, its electron density or specifically its pi electron density can be represented pictorially by a molecular orbital shown here. This is known as a pi bonding orbital and it contains the two electrons in the second bond between the carbon atoms in this uh, spatial distribution shown here by the blue electron cloud. The thing is though that pi orbitals are not as fixed as sigma orbitals, as the sigma bonds. They are not forced to reside neatly between the two atoms. Instead, the overlap between the p orbitals that forms a pi bond is relatively weak. That sideways overlap isn't as strong as the end over end overlap that forms a sigma bond. And so there are some unique effects that happen. And one of them is the fact that a pi bond can be delocalized or uh, split up from its constituent parts. So instead of residing completely in the middle of two atoms, like a normal sigma bond, it can shift completely onto one atom or the other, in which case the pi bond breaks apart into its constituent p orbitals and the electrons move onto one atom or the other. What does that actually look like? Well, if we were to go ahead and show a electron arrow pushing, right, we would say that this second bond here that I'm circling, right, is going to move onto say the right hand carbon right the arrow indicates that the bond the two electrons in that bond are going to move onto the right hand carbon's p orbital right if from an orbital perspective right in the blue electron cloud that means these two electrons are going to move onto this carbon's p orbital and the pi bond is going to break right typically when we do this we don't circle the bond so in reality the electron pushing arrow will just look like this right what will that look like in terms of the structural diagram? Well, it'll result in something like this, where the left carbon and right carbon are now formally charged because they either have a deficiency or an excess of electrons. The left carbon, which lost the pi bond completely, is now deficient in electrons and positively charged. The carbon on the right, though, having picked up both electrons from the pi bond, is now negatively charged. From an orbital perspective, the way that looks is that the pi bond has broken into its constituent p orbitals, which are parallel with one another, but the electrons now firmly reside in one p orbital, in this case, the one on the right, giving it a formal negative charge, whereas the p orbital on the left is completely empty, giving that carbon a formal positive charge. This can also happen with any pi bond. It doesn't just have to be carbon-carbon pi bonds. For example, if we go ahead and look at the formaldehyde molecule, or the carbonyl group in general, the C double O group, it also has resonance structures associated with it in, based on how the pi bond can split up between the carbon and the oxygen. One possibility is that the pi bond goes from the middle of these two atoms onto the oxygen with an arrow denoted as such. The electrons are moving from the bond firmly onto the oxygen and that would provide this resonance structure. In this case, the oxygen gains a formal negative charge as it's picked up the electron density, and the carbon, having lost the bond, is now formally positive. Another possibility, though, is because this bond is not symmetrical like ethylene is, because there's different atoms, we could also say that maybe instead of going onto the oxygen, the bond will move onto the carbon as such. In this case, the carbon would pick up the electrons and the oxygen will become deficient. And so the structural diagram will look like this, where O is now positive and electron deficient and carbon is negative, being electron rich. Which one of these is better? Which one is a better representation of the molecule? Well, it depends. There's a couple factors that go into it, right? Generally, the most important characteristics for determining the importance of a resonance structure to the overall molecule are as follows. The first is that all the atoms have a full octet, and specifically that period two cannot have more than eight. Some larger atoms can actually expand their valence to include d orbitals, and 
take more than an octet of electrons. However, period two, C, N, O, and F cannot do this. So don't try to force more than eight electrons. But, right, so the number one priority is that the best resonance structure, that is the best representation of the pi bond, is the one that has all the atoms with a full octet. So in that case, that would be this structure here. This one is going to have the full octets. In this case, the carbon is electron deficient, it has less than eight. And in this case, the oxygen is electron deficient. It has less than eight. So these two are not great resonance structures. They are not very strongly contributing to the overall molecule because of those deficiencies. The second thing we should consider, I'm going to go ahead and erase this, is that formal charges are minimized to zero. Separation of formal charges is somewhat energetically unfavorable because opposite charges attract, and so pulling them apart into full positive and negative charges creates a higher energy state. And so the molecule, or the resonance structure rather, that has the lowest formal charges will often be the most stable. So again, in this case, this structure has zero net formal charge and it will be the most stable. Here we have a separation of formal charge in both structures, which is somewhat unstable. Now, how do we judge which one is better between this structure and this structure? Well, it depends on the formal charge placement, right? Formal charges are best placed on the atom which best accommodates them. What does that mean? Well, if you have a negative charge, for example, you want to put that negative charge on the atom that best stabilizes it. That's going to be a strongly electronegative atom or one that is very polarizable so that the charge can spread out. In this case, oxygen is more electronegative than carbon, and so the oxygen will better accommodate the negative charge. As a result, this structure is better than this structure. So if we were to go ahead and rank how much each of these three resonance structures contribute to the overall molecule, our order would be one, two, and three. The one on the left is the best because it has full octets and no formal charges. The second one is better than the third one because the oxygen better stabilizes the negative charge when it does go ahead and appear. Oftentimes, though, in organic chemistry, we're going to be dealing with structures that involve multiple pi bonds in series. Pi bonds that are adjacent to one another are said to be conjugated, and those pi bonds actually interact with one another. For example, let's look at this molecule here, which is a hexatriene species. It has three conjugated double bonds. Right? I'm also going to go ahead and throw up a parallel series on the right so that we can work through both the structural pictures and the molecular orbital pictures at the same time so we can see really in great detail what is happening between these resonance structures. So if we were to go ahead and look at the orbital picture for this uh, hexatriene species, we would see that it looks something like this at present. Right? Each of the double bonds has a pi bond with the electrons shared in that uh, sort of top-bottom distribution between the two carbons that are participating in the pi bond. However, because these pi bonds are conjugated, there are quite a few resonance structures that could describe this molecule. For example, if we go ahead and start with the leftmost pi bond, right, we can move the, uh, just like we did with ethylene, we can move the electron density firmly onto the carbon on the right instead of being shared between the two. Right? We could go ahead and push it with an arrow as such, such that the, all of the electron density will now reside on that carbon. Right? And that would give the following resonance structure. Right? In this case, the carbon on the left is electron deficient and positive, and the, electron, and the carbon on the right is now electron rich. It carries a formal negative charge. How will this look in the orbital picture? Well, if we were to go ahead and break this pi bond up by splitting all of the electron density onto this carbon, we're going to split it into its constituent two p orbitals. Right? So that'll look something like this. Right, that pi bond has been eliminated, and now both of the electrons firmly reside on the carbon on the right as a formal negative, and the p orbital on the left is completely empty. That carbon has a partial positive. But now we have this p orbital here carrying a full uh, negative charge, and it's adjacent to another p orbital. Right. So what can happen there? Well, it turns out that this negative charge can push the pi bond next to it. So it can actually go ahead and move into here, into the space where there, it appears that there's just a single bond. That negative charge can push there and break this pi bond here, kicking the electrons up onto the adjacent carbon, right? And that would give the following resonance structure. 
here where this carbon is still partial positive, but now there's a pi bond between these two carbons, and this one has kicked up a form, picked up a formal negative charge. How is this happening, right? What is going on here? So if we imagine, right, this orbital, this p orbital, is parallel to what we imagine is going on here as two p orbitals which are interacting with one another in a pi bond. However, because all of these orbitals are parallel to one another, these two orbitals on the left can just as well interact as this set of orbitals on the right. In fact, they do interact simultaneously. There's a superposition where the overall molecule is a sum of both interactions. And so when we draw the resonance structure, what we can imagine happening is that this lone pair in this p orbital can actually attack this or, uh, p orbital here that's part of this pi bond and cleave this pi bond, actually break it apart. What will happen then is that these two orbitals will now form a pi bond and the electrons that were in this p orbital, or in this pi orbital, uh, excuse me, will move firmly onto that p orbital, right? So what that'll look like is like this. We've split the, the pi orbital, this one here, that existed. We've split it up and we've taken the p orbital from this carbon and formed a bond with that p orbital. And that gave us this bond here. However, the p orbital on the right hand side of this uh, bond now contains both electrons have moved into that p orbital which is represented here, which is why this carbon now carries a formal negative charge. We can do this once more, actually. And so if we go back to our structure on the left, we can take this negative charge and once again push it one more time onto the carbon all the way on the right-hand side. That'll give us one more resonance structure where there is now a bond between these two carbons, which did not originally exist in our first structure, and the negative charge is now on the carbon on the right. This in an orbital sense, would look as follows, right? The same thing that just happened, but now to the second pi bond, this orbital here will go ahead and attack this pi bond, break it, and push the electron density onto that carbon. That forms a new pi bond between these two carbons, and the formal negative charge is placed in a p orbital on this carbon here. What does this tell us? Well, this whole molecule, this whole hexatriene, is a superposition of all of these resonance structures. And so if we were to look at the overall molecule, what we would see is that in reality, we would see that each carbon contains a p orbital and that all of these p orbitals are interacting with one another, right? Each p orbital has the possibility to form a bond with the other. And so there is actually a slight double bond character to every single carbon-carbon bond in this molecule. There is a partial double bond between all of the carbons. However, these bonds here are stronger than these two here. Why? Well, if we go ahead and erase all our red here so we can see a better picture, we see that this this uh, representation has no formal charges. And so this is the best resonance structure for this molecule. It's the most contributing. These structures here give some character, which is why the entire molecule has some double bond character, some pi bond character to every bond. But these pi bonds, or rather, let me just draw it on this one here, these pi bonds that arise in a charged resonance structure are less contributing. And so there is less double bond character to these bonds than there is to these three bonds, right? So this is how you go ahead and move electron density between resonance structures using arrows, right? You move the bond onto a different carbon, and in the process, you can break a pi bond and split it into its component orbitals and even form new pi bonds as a result. And with that, we've actually reached the end of the content for this video. Thank you guys so much for watching, and if you enjoyed what you saw, please like and subscribe to the channel. To learn more, check out our other videos in the chemistry playlists, and if you're looking to branch out, check out our other science playlists as well. See you next time!